This is a world where rulers use media for their gains. This is a world where rulers call media fake news. This is a world where media landscape is marred by censorship. What is happening in South Asian media? In our studio tonight, we have Kanak Dixit, the founding editor of Himal, and Mahfuz Anam, the editor of the Daily Star, Bangladesh. Also with us, virtually, we are connected to Pakistan. We have Babar Ayaz, the author of the book, What's Wrong with Pakistan? The only glitch that I'm kind of anticipating is the South Asian connectivity bit, <laughs> because off air, we were trying to connect to India and Pakistan, and the connection, unfortunately, is terrible. <laughs> so we may just have to uh, record them later on and, and take the reactions later on. But uh, at least in spirit, we are all there together. So thank you once again. My uh, first question to both of you is, who is a journalist in South Asia or even globally? Is he a traitor or a patriot? I think we all journalists are patriots. <laughs> it's the issue, uh, it's, it's uh, a problem of definition because we speak to power and power always thinks that they have a monopoly on patriotism, they have a monopoly of, uh, of knowing what is public good and we journalists contest it. So in their eyes, we are not patriots, but in I think in the eyes of the people, if I, if I may say so, or at least in our eyes, uh, we are very much patriots. Responsible patriots, Kanak, or irresponsible patriots? Well, certainly uh, media people are, have their weaknesses like people in all other professions. But there is no doubt that uh, uh, as government becomes increasingly autocratic, uh, and this is a trend all over South Asia, uh, the job of the journalist, she or he, is to speak truth to power. And in doing that, certainly it is the easiest, lowest common denominator uh, method for those in power to uh, challenge the, the antecedents, the patriotism, the nationalism, the professionalism of the journalist. So I think we must be skeptical when governments or the state functionaries uh, try to come down heavily on journalists because they use many tropes, they use uh, various tricks uh, to try to question the probity of journalists. Um, so I think uh, the journalistic fraternity uh, has got to give it back. It's got to unite for sure. It also has to unite across borders of South Asia. Is it only South Asia, Mr. Anam, or is it? Uh... <laughs> no, I think journalism is under pressure uh, or is being questioned all over the world um, and somewhere, some, some, in some places very uh, harshly. My feeling is that some of it we deserve. Uh, I and think why would you say that? Because, um, uh, you know, our main purpose is to represent public interest. Now, in doing so, um, sometimes we forgot the public and started representing interest. And it has happened in many parts of the world. Um, and then suddenly the, the social media came about. Um, let me just interrupt you. When you talk about interest, is it corporate interest or? I kept it vague. Uh, corporate interest, government interest, mm -hmm. uh, vested interest. In fact, newspaper itself in many countries became such a big industry that they forgot that their primary uh, you know, focus is to represent public interest. So they, in the process of growth, they became themselves, if you like, uh, major actors in the economy. So I would just say interest. Now, what has been very interesting is that with the emergence of social media, when, if you like, heritage media, as we are called, or, or established media, as we are called, suddenly when we saw that uh, people were shifting to social media, and basically the ground was shifting from under our feet, we started asking questions. 
and why are they shifting? Why? And any in many countries, if you take a survey uh, opinion poll, they say journalism is among those professions which is not trusted anymore. So I think we needed the shock. The social media gave us that shock that uh, people prefer to listen to gossip uh, on the on Facebook rather than listen to a serious article or read a serious article in a serious magazine or a newspaper. That shock has suddenly made us realize that we we were missing on the public. Kanak, I would I would ask you this. Uh, Mahfuz Bhai just said that. Um, in, in the social media kind of beat the conventional media to it. But he did mention that people like listening to their own voices. Um, and, and often it's, it's gossip, rumor. Mm -hmm. So does that mean rumor, speculation, or imagination has overtaken reality? I think it's a temporary phenomenon, but it's certainly happening because we are all grappling with we're all first-generation social media wallers. Whether you're a 16-year-old or a 70-year-old, Everybody is tackling this new phenomenon at the same time. And so the protocols are still being uh, sort of worked out in our minds. So what is happening for now, in the last five years all over, is that, or five to eight years, is that uh, social media is helping, uh, has uh, shaken up the editorial rooms. So I see it happening in Nepal, where I come from as well. I mean, there are two aspects uh, of media as I see. One is reflecting public opinion. The other is, in a sense, not directing, but giving the public a feedback as to what our experience-based editorials or sort of thinking is. Okay, So we need to reflect public opinion. But public opinion not necessarily is the wisest of opinion. So there has to be a balance. So where we are now going is, uh, if I may go back a bit, is that we started, the media profession started, at least journalism started by reflecting public opinion. Then over time, we got overconfident and started telling the public what their opinion should be. Social media dislodged it. So basically, manufacturing consent. Uh, no, mm. uh, let me just finish this. Uh, that So we became overconfident and tried, started telling the public what they should be thinking. Social media destroyed that. So now I think we are going into a more balanced phase of journalism where we are listening to the people much more than we did before, but we are also not, not totally surrendering to, if you like, the marketplace of, uh, of, of gossip or conversation. So it is a balance. We are reflecting that, uh, reflecting what the people are thinking, but also we are trying to say, look, this is good for the economy, this is good for democracy, this is good for public, you know, public interest. So it's a balance, which is where we should be in my view. This brings me to a point, if I may, is that the use of the judiciary to throttle the media. This is, uh, it, it's quite old in South Asia, but I think it has taken a new turn in which, you know, laws, um, the judiciary, unfortunately, is under um, a, a greater uh, influence uh, of the executive. And therefore, the executive branch now can feel quite comfortable using at least the lower judiciary in, in, in yes. entangling you in so many cases and this and that and issues like treason you know, are flung all the time. In my view, if you ask me... I, um, that we, we are still talking sorry, about sorry. the... The particular Pakistani journalist, mm. and, and since Mr. Babaray, as if you permit, mm. he's still online. Yeah. And I think I'd like to, you know, just go to him for a minute and just ask him uh, about his reaction. Basically, my question is, uh, your book was, what's wrong with Pakistan? And I'd like to ask you, what's right with Pakistan right now? Especially with uh, journalists being harassed. Pakistan media is being stifled through insidious ways by the establishment of the Pakistan. The most Im important examples are that they blocked the uh, circulation of most important paper, English paper of the Pakistan, which is called Dawn. At the same time, they are also muzzling the voice of Geo TV, which is the largest television network in Pakistan. 
Pakistan has also seen that the establishment has been trying to manage or micromanage rather the electronic media and they are buying away the anchors to do the programs of their liking. So at the very outset, I can say that in Pakistan, the media is being controlled in very insidiously and indirectly. So that was Baba Rayaz with his, with his views anyway. But the particular Pakistani journalist who has been basically summoned uh, has been, it's, it's only because he interviewed Nawaz Sharif. And you know, it's atrocious. <laughs> and he interviewed Nawaz Sharif where Nawaz Sharif implied that the attackers uh, in, during the Bombay attacks um, were uh, originated in Pakistan. So that is supposed to be in the military influenced state apparatus in Pakistan. That is supposed to be fodder for uh, taking you in for treason. And so I think that uh, uh, probably uh, the worst is not over for journalists in South Asia. At the national level, when a, a word, a term such as treason is so easily bandied about, but if you talk from the national level right down to the Mufasal, uh, at the district level, where journalists are extremely vulnerable, uh, and they are actually vulnerable uh, from the Gunda Raj that exists, uh, where the police does not provide you protection at the ground level. Uh, and this could be said for any corner of South Asia. And the journalist is very, very vulnerable. So I feel that we must, when we speak, speak about journalists under attack or being vulnerable, we must always remember that it's the full spectrum. It's not only me, uh, journalists in, in various media, from social media, uh, from online media rather, to print to uh, television, television uh, but we must also think of it vertically from the national to the Mufasal. And I personally think that there is much more vulnerability and hence much less professionalism at the ground level, which is where you should be doing good journalism. On that, on that note, we'll just take a short break and, and be back with you in, in a minute. So Mahfuz Bhai, um, referring to Kanak's uh, reference to journalists being in fear, or being extremely vulnerable, would you agree? And uh, do you think there's a sense of uh, censorship or self-censorship uh, crawling up or creeping up in the whole uh, system or the landscape where we are not being able to say what we actually want to say? I, I think there are two serious dangers to uh, honest journalism. One is the censorship uh, fear, uh, a a a angle. The other is, if you like, the reward angle. The journalists are being given a lot of rewards by corporates or by the government. You know, this uh, housing uh, project, this uh, welfare project. <laughs> so journalists are being, <laughs> if you like, corrupted. Uh, one sense that you are forced. Or incentivized. Uh, what, they are incentivized <laughs> on the positive side and they are uh, being uh, put under a fear sort of a psychology on the negative side. These are the two serious uh, you know, threats to, I think, independent journalism. What has happened in South Asia, and it, it varies, Pakistan, India, and Bangladesh, if I may take this, that you know, the democratic political structure was premised on division of power you know, separation of power. So the legislators had some independence and they, they make the laws. Then you have the judiciary, who, who itself had, a, had, had some separate powers. And then the executive. Now in South Asia, what we have seen is the emergence of the executive as the branch. You know, they have taken over the function of the legislative or, or influence. They have definitely put the judiciary under a lot of strain. India perhaps less than others, but Pakistan also had a format. Bangladesh, we, we see that. So the emergence of 
powerful executive branch overriding everybody else. Now they control, if you like, on the on the money side they have the budget. On the uh, on the coercion side they have the police, the intelligence, and everybody. And they're using it on journalists. And that is also, if you like, hampering. I would say the growth of professionalism, growth of really journalism that represents public interest. In the past, you had the state coming down heavily with the state censor, you know, blacking out papers, saying you cannot print this, having directives. I think now uh, there is much more self-censorship. And self-censorship is that much more dangerous because it is, uh, it is actually across the board. And self-censorship can happen when a journalist feels intimidated by the, by the government. The government has various tools to go after journalists and publishers, including court cases that any government can, uh, you know, put into the uh, into the field for against publishers and journalists. But there are also other areas from where people can journalists can fear and become self-censoring. One of them is. Uh, fear of the public opinion against you, populist opinion. I call it ultra-populism, nationalism. Anything that could be seen as being anti-national, even though uh, you're not being that, you could be labeled such. Uh, or there is uh, social media trolling that comes after you yeah. the moment you write something and say something that's slightly against populist opinion. So I think uh, various ways in which, in which today there is self-censorship, um, so it's not only the government, it's the market, it's the public at large mm -hmm. using social media. So I think the la landscape of censorship is much more complex now than it was a decade or two ago. Supporting what Connick said, that before, uh, if you like, the executive branch came strongly against you through censorship, we could run to the judiciary for some sort of a respite. That confidence was there that we would go to a court and court said, yes, this is violation of the Constitution, freedom of speech must be upheld, and we would get a respite. That possibility has drastically reduced in South Asia. And interestingly, all over South Asia, if the judiciary is to be, uh, there, should, there used to be no question that the judiciary stands, has probity and will stand by the side of free media, for example. But it has come about, uh, the situation has evolved in such a way that we've got to applaud the exceptional judge who will rule for free media. That itself shows how corrupted everything has become. So basically, the exception has become the standard. <laughs> yeah. We've really set our bars low. Um, yeah. But then, uh, coming back to Kanak's point, I'm actually very, very apprehensive and very scared because he just said that, you know, being anti-populist mm. or being anti um, ultra-nationalistic yeah. poses a threat for a journalist. Uh, well, as a media house, currently we're talking about South Asian collaboration and integration, <laughs> where we are literally um, thinking that we should be having cross-border exercises, serious media exercises, and where we should all be coming together anyway. Uh, so are we? We should, but, uh, <laughs> but here is the situation. Is it the right thing to do, it considering is what Kanak has just definitely said? Definitely the right thing to do, because the way ahead is uh, f to have all kinds of identities, including the local, the national, the metropolitan, the district, and the South Asian. And so uh, this region, which contains nearly a fourth of the world's population, has to uh, reach back to its history to build its future. So in that sense, of course we must think South Asian, and we must report each other's countries and societies much more. But um, the fact that till now South Asia as a term uh, has not raised any um, tension in the minds of the rulers would mean that it has not, it has been a harmless kind of an idea. Or rather ineffective. Uh, ineffective Sark, for or instance. Harmless. But the moment South Asia as a term begins to get traction, you will begin to get resistance from the state powers in each country. To b give you an example, uh, at this point, um, in Bangladesh and in, um, in Nepal, where I come from, South Asia is seen as a warm and welcome idea. But not in India, at least not among the state functionaries in India. Right now, uh, there will be 
uh, commentators who will think that uh, the South Asian idea is actually uh, something that is targeting India and that therefore it is not a welcome thought at all. We must overcome this through sheer logic. Unless India leads. <laughs> that is always there. In, in, in fact, uh, Mr. Modi said uh, in so many words, uh, either we all go together or some of us only, implying that South Asia as a whole might not walk in the same manner under SARC organization. So it was a formula for kind of breaking up the idea of South Asia. I think globally, we are into a, you know, a, a, we, have, we are falling out of idealism. Um, if you, you know, the, some of the promises, if you, if you like, the world had made to itself after the Second World War, that after so much devastation, we said, this is the war that has taught us that war is uh, not the option, uh, acrimony is not the option, unity and cooperation is the option. So we made three promises, if you like, and who made, I'm not saying that, maybe to ourselves, civilization made to itself, that after the Second World War, we'll have more freedom, okay? People will have more freedom. People will have more prosperity. And people will have more equality. On all three grounds, the performance have been discriminatory. I think in terms of freedom, if you like, uh, uh, decolonization took place. We, many, many countries became independent. But in, in terms of equality, particularly rich and poor, the world has failed itself. In terms of cooperation, uh, which we went to some extent. But right now, I would say on these three promises, independence, yes, only in the form of states. But each of the decolonized states re in, in fact, re-established the colonial mindset. The, the, the white rulers were replaced by the brown and the black rulers, and they behaved, in some cases, worse. So the idealism that spurred us immediately after the Second World War are now at a very low level. At the moment, led by Mr. Trump, America first, so we are all being taught to say Bangladesh first, India first, Japan first, and in this first, first obsession, the country with the biggest power and military power, economic power, will be the first. So this, this sense of America first leading to China first or India first is really, if you like, antithetical to the type of cooperative mindset that the world needs. I'm sure it will come back because that's the only way the world can survive. But at the moment, it is going in the opposite direction. And it is going in the opposite direction in, at a time when we face the greatest crisis, which is coming from climate change. Climate change is only possible to resist, or if you like, mitigate, if we cooperate. Now, this is, the world has never needed unity as it needs now. And it has never missed it as it is missing now. On that note, uh, let me just ask kind of quickly, uh, this America first, India first, and so on and so forth, China first. Bangladesh first. Well, we're still not bragging. <laughs> we're still Nepal not bragging. First. Oh, Nepal, right. You could start it now. <laughs> but you see, uh, even with Mr. Trump, uh, the first policy ha is actually boosting the economy. So when there are corporate interests being served, people may not miss collaborating too much. You know, the... But if I may interrupt, this, sure. this e economic upturn, I'm sure, will be very transitory. Yeah, but I mean, the, 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 the extent of damage that is being done yeah. because of this, it'll, it'll come probably, back to yeah, I mean, it'll probably uh, trickle over to <coughs> the next decade or so. How do we handle it now? Because a press as free as it is in America, even that is being uh, literally... Made, it, it's, it's being made fun of. Mm, mm, uh, so mm. press is a subject of ridicule now. Mm. How do you see journalism well, I think, uh, in the West? Uh, what saves us uh, from Mr. Trump is Mr. Trump's lack of credibility. Uh, he is genuinely a laughing stock across <laughs> the globe. Uh, and not only in the General Assembly chamber the other day when he spoke before the UN. Uh, picking up on the point uh, Mafus Bhai made, about um, how Trump's um, America First um, 
agenda will catch, will dangerously will be catching all over. And to think, put, place that in the context of South Asia. The idea of, I believe, rational economists is that South Asia, especially the countries, because India as a whole is very large and it's a massive economy on its own right, but South Asia as a whole to lift itself up needs soft borders, needs uh, connectivity, it needs uh, economy of scale across borders. All of these things are givens. And uh, given that the countries, if you don't count Nepal as a non-colonized entity within South Asia, all the other countries, their nationalisms are only 70 years old. And what Trump is asking you to do is to each of you, you Sri Lankan, you Pakistani, you Indian, you Bangladeshi, all of you are going to be like fortresses. And you are just going to rise yourself. It may work for some societies. It will not work for South Asia. So what is the job of journalists in the middle of this, of all of this, is to stand up to that ultra-populist, ultra-nationalist narrative by saying that it is not even economically feasible. It is not good for social justice within South Asia. It is not good for your economy nor for mine. And therefore, we must create a new narrative, which, frankly, in all the decades of saying South Asia, we have failed. And maybe now when Mr. Narendra Modi, picking up essentially where Mr. Trump leaves off, is not thinking of South Asia as a whole, it's the rest of us must start the counter-narrative to so think rest, South Asia. rest of us. <laughs> Again, minus India. Kanaka. Well, minus Mr. Modi. <laughs> minus Mr. Modi. <laughs> yes. Interesting. Um, Mahfuz Bhai and Kanak, thank you very much for being with us tonight. It was a sheer pleasure. <laughs> just, just by listening to you, I mean, one definitely gains um, a particular South Asian perspective in which we can basically bank on and probably a new narrative based on all your conviction, could probably be formed. So thank you very much. Thank We're deeply honored that you us. came here. Thank you. If you don't believe in freedom of expression for people who you despise, then you don't believe in it at all. That was Noam Chomsky, uh, the American philosopher. So let, hopefully, tolerance triumph over intolerance. Let, hopefully, faith triumph over suspicion. And let South Asia be together. Thank you for watching us and see you next time in Nagarik again.